Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's November 2023, and you're listening to Episode 366, which is a conversation about the use of mockery in apologetics. On this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Doug Groteis, who is Professor of Philosophy at Denver Seminary. Doug is also the author of 15 books, including Fire in the Streets and Christian Apologetics, Second Edition, which was published in 2022. Doug has written an online article for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called The Use of Mockery in Apologetics. You can read it for free at our website, equip.org. Doug, it's good to have you on. Thank you. Happy to be back. Well, as I mentioned, Doug has written an article that has quite the provocative title, Mockery in Apologetics. And that's kind of an interesting word because that doesn't necessarily uh, bring about thoughts of, you know, trying to reach people in a winsome manner, perhaps, but we're going to unpack that today. But before we do, I just kind of want to ask Doug about the state of, you know, old school Christian apologetics. It seems like Christians have moved away from that and are employing different kinds of methods these days. And so why would traditional apologetics still be relevant in 2023? Well, it is because the arguments for God's existence and the reliability of the Bible, the deity of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and so on, and the arguments against atheism and pantheism, they're all still very strong. So the issue is take the strong, solid, well-established arguments and speak them into the contemporary setting as courageously and creatively and compassionately as we possibly can. You never get beyond apologetics because As Peter said, we need to give a reason for the hope that is within us when people ask us about our faith and do it with gentleness and respect and do it even when people don't ask us. We need to go out and initiate conversations, give lectures, write articles. We need to make the truth known because the truth of Christ is so eternally significant. Well, now I want to ask you specifically about this particular article of yours and why would you write this article, and especially why would you give it that title, Mockery in Apologetics? Mm -hmm. I've written a lot about apologetics over the years. I have a big, fat book called Christian Apologetics, and I've taught it for over 30 years at Denver Seminary. But I'm also really interested in not only the arguments proper uh, for God, Christ, the Bible, and so on, but also how do we get the arguments across? How do we get people to listen to us? And I was thinking about areas of apologetics I had not written about. And I thought about this about a year and a half ago for a conference I was going to speak at. And I thought about mockery. And I realized that there were some apologists that used mockery well. And the Bible itself, while it condemns one kind of mockery, actually employs another kind of mockery. So This is in the category of rhetoric, basically. It's how do you communicate the argument? What kind of style do you use? And I don't mean rhetoric like mere rhetoric or political rhetoric, but it has to do with your manner of presenting an argument or how do you spark someone's attention and make a point. And the other category it fits in usually is what's called negative apologetics. Negative apologetics means critiquing non-Christian worldviews as illogical and false. And sometimes views are so absurd, non-Christian views, that they need to be shown as absurd. And this is an argument form called reductio ad absurdum, 
which is basically uh, if P then Q, Q is absurd, therefore not P. So mockery is sometimes appropriate when someone believes something that is absurd, but they may not see that it's absurd. So you have to drive that home. And sometimes a kind of mockery can be helpful in doing that. So when we think about mockery, especially in today's culture, online and social media, you know, there is a lot of criticism about what is perceived as people's tone. And so how would you say this is an approach that you're going to explain that should be used when people just have a visceral reaction to the idea of tone that does not seem to bend over backwards to accommodate perhaps a different worldview? Right. Well, I know the subject is pretty dangerous and delicate because I'd say 90% of the mockery we find in media today is ungodly and would be condemned by scripture. And there's a lot of condemnation of mockery in scripture. I, in my article, I list several. Uh, one of them would be, how long will you, uh, who are simple, love your simple ways? How long will you mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? That's Proverbs one twenty two, Proverbs 9, 8. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. So mockery in scripture is often condemned, but it's condemned if it's foolish that is, if people are without knowledge and they are deriding or ridiculing something that is really good. So the ultimate uh, and worst mockery was experienced by Jesus. He was uh, mocked when he was taken into custody before his crucifixion and during his crucifixion. And his followers were mocked as being drunk when they were really filled with the Spirit. You find that in Acts chapter 2. So we have to really guard our hearts. We should never be hating people or playing a kind of game to show people how smart we are and how stupid they are. So you've got to do this carefully. I have a quote in the article from one of my apologetic heroes, the late Francis Schaeffer, and he says in The God Who Is There, I need to remind myself constantly that this, he means apologetic endeavor, this is not a game I am playing. If I begin to enjoy it as a kind of intellectual exercise, then I am cruel and can expect no real spiritual results. As I push the man off his false balance, meaning his false worldview, he must be able to feel that I care for him. Otherwise, I will only end up destroying him, and the cruelty and ugliness of it all will destroy me as well. But there are some ideas that are ridiculous, that are absurd, and I think should be shown to be absurd. And in the article, I, I very briefly talk about the great church father Irenaeus, who was an apologist against Gnosticism. He wrote a book called Against Heresies. And I quoted this long ago in my book, Revealing the New Age Jesus, and I put it in my second edition of Christian Apologetics. Somehow, I didn't put it in the first edition, but it's really too good to leave out. Irenaeus was dealing with the Gnostic worldview that claimed that the ultimate reality, which they called the pleroma or the fullness, was beyond words. Technically, this is called the ineffability thesis, that uh, the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality cannot be described in words. And so... Irenaeus quotes a long, pompous passage uh, talking about, in the Gnostics, about what cannot be described and what cannot be named, but it uses names. But it says that no name is adequate. So the Gnostics used profound-sounding names for ultimate reality, like Proarch and mono Monotes. And he says, well, if any word is good enough, I'll just use words like melon, gourd, and cucumber. So if any word is appropriate for the unknowable, unsayable ultimate reality, why can't I use fruit and uh, vegetable language? So that just shows how absurd the idea is, because biblically, God is a God who speaks. You know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. All things were made through him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And 
the word has made the father known. This is all from John chapter one. So I think Irenaeus was a, a very good example of ridiculing a ridiculous idea for the sake of apologetics and commending and defending the truth of God in scripture. A lot of publications, Christian or otherwise, have opted to put their content under a paywall. So a lot of times you go online and there's an article you're interested in and you can only read part of it unless you put in your credit card to become a member to that site ongoing with a digital subscription. Well, we did have a subscription for our print edition, which is no longer being produced. However, the journal content has not gone away. We give you free articles and new content every single week, just to anyone who goes to equip.org. Simply go to our front page and click journal. And then when you do, you'll see a section for articles. Not only do we have free articles that is new content that you hear featured on this podcast, we also are putting up articles that haven't been on our website before. And that is also going into our article section. However, even though we don't have a paid subscription anymore, we do ask that you consider supporting the journal with some donations for equipping resources from our authors or by tipping us. Now, we have some books that we're currently featuring that you could support the journal with a gift and get one of these equipping resources. We have resources from Mama Bear Apologetics and recently Hillary Morgan Ferrer was on talking about the Barbie movie. We have their guide to sexuality as well as their general apologetics book. We also have a new book from longtime journal author Doug Grotheis, World Religions in Seven Sentences. And earlier this fall, we featured Ross Anderson and Corey Miller and their book, Responding to the Mormon Missionary Message. So would you please consider partnering with us? We don't have anything like a Patreon or something like that, but we ask that you consider partnering with us as we pay our authors for their work and continue to bring you this free podcast. You can easily do that when you go to equip.org and you scroll down a bit. You'll see that there's a section for gifts for your donation and you'll see a graphic there for these resources from our journal authors. And why would you do this instead of just buy a book from Amazon or your favorite online retailer. Well, you do this because when you get a book from us, from our authors, you are also supporting the work of the Christian Research Journal. So thank you for your consideration. We really appreciate you thinking through partnering with us, whether it is a donation for one of the resources that we're offering from one of our authors or simply giving us a tip, which you can easily do if you go to equip.org journal, postmodern realities, and then at any landing page, you will see a link to give us a tip. But now, back to our conversation with Dr. Doug Grotheis about the use of mockery in apologetics. Well, you mentioned a little bit about biblical writers and mockery, but what are some of the other examples in scripture where there is a use of mockery. And if we see that written, you know, does that mean we're encouraged to employ that? Right. You have to be careful in how you read the scripture and you have to ask, well, why is mockery being employed? Some of the mockery in scripture comes directly from God and it's simply a condemnation. You don't even know if it had any apologetic effect. Uh, for example, in Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel says this against the rule of Tyre. This is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a mere mortal and not a God, though you think you are as wise as a God. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, because you think you are as wise, as wise as a God. I'm going to bring foreigners against you, the most ruthless of nations. They will draw their swords against your beauty and wisdom and pierce your shining splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. Will you then say, I am a God? 
in the presence of those who kill you, you will be but a mortal, not a god. In the hands of those who slay you, you will die the death of the uncircumcised at the hands of foreigners. Now that's Ezekiel 28, 1 through 3 and 6 through 10. That's a word of condemnation and judgment. So the man who claims the man who claims to be God is a mere mortal, and he will be judged by the true God. Now, that condemnation had no positive effect on the king of Tyre, but it could be used against someone who makes a claim to be one with the universal energy, the universal force. So they might say, I am really God, or I am really divine. But you have to realize that human beings are finite and limited. We get sick, we die, we make mistakes, we sin, etc. So it could be that a passage like this, while the original purpose was to condemn this haughty, arrogant ruler, could perhaps have an apologetic effect on a pantheist. In fact, there's a section of Chesterton's great book, Orthodoxy, where he he really makes fun of people who claim to be divine. And he's doing something actually like what Ezekiel was doing. And we have, we have other examples of this also. Jesus sometimes mocked people if something was particularly ridiculous. Now, of course, when we cite Jesus as an example, we have to realize that he was sinless and perfect. So if he said something, uh, he never sinned. But then we have to also remember we are sinners and it may be difficult for us to use mockery in a righteous way. But let me give you an example. Matthew 23, verses 23 through 24. This is part of the great condemnations that Jesus gives to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Now, that's actually funny. And uh, D. Elton Trueblood points that out in his book, The Humor of Christ. Jesus was sometimes pretty humorous in what he said, although we may not notice it. You know, you blind guides, what do you do? Blind guide is a funny idea already. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Well, that's certainly mockery. And it was used by our Lord. And there are other examples in scripture too. So I think mockery can be a legitimate way to bring people to realize the absurdities of their beliefs or the absurdities of their actions. But it has to be used carefully. We really have to search our own hearts, guard our own hearts. And I think the use of mockery and apologetics has to pass several tests. Let me give you some of those. First, we have to properly identify an idea or person as absurd. Otherwise, the mockery commits a fallacy of the straw man. So we need to have the right target, which means we need to be attentive. Second, the mockery should be clever enough to work and not fall flat. This takes a kind of skill, and not everyone has it, and not everyone needs to have it. But in some cases, it might be appropriate. Third, the mockery must not be done for the sake of wanton cruelty or egotistic purposes. So we need to be filled with the spirit, not act out of the flesh. And this should be part of the apologetic project to convince unbelievers to leave their foolish ways behind and to embrace Christ. And fourth, the apologist needs to discern if mockery is the right method at the right time and with the right person. You typically don't want to use mockery in a friendly conversation with someone. Or if you do, it needs to be really lighthearted. And you need to be sensitive to the person's worldview. You need to be sensitive to where the conversation is going. You don't want to be off-putting, right? But in some cases, people's hearts are really hard or they are so entrenched in their errors that they need to be jolted a little bit. They need to be stung a little bit. And I think that's where mockery 
can come in handy. I'd say typically in a one-on-one conversation, you wouldn't want to use it. I think it can be used well in writing. It might be used well in a lecture. It might be used well in a debate. But even there, we want to really avoid the kind of arrogant, egotistical mockery that you would find in someone, let's say, like a Bill Maher today. We don't want to use him as an example at all. So if we need to, for the Christian apologist, avoid arrogance and being demeaning, what would be the point of even employing this technique in apologetics? It would be used as a kind of shock therapy, so to speak. Oz Guinness writes about this in his excellent book, Fool's Talk. If someone is very open to God, to the gospel, then they have a listening ear and they have an open heart. And so we can proceed directly to explain the biblical worldview and the gospel message. But there are a lot of people, as Oz says, who are just a million miles from being Christians. So they're not really interested. They're not going to ask you, well, why do you think the Bible is reliable? Or what are your reasons for thinking Jesus is God? They might be mocking themselves, have kind of a deriding tone. So in that kind of a situation, it might be good to employ some creative mockery or ridicule of their own ideas. Again, this is difficult to do. Oz points this out in his book. Not everyone has this skill, but it is sometimes appropriate. In fact, I started my article by quoting something that is in the beginning of the screw tape letters. He quotes Luther, the best way to drive out the devil, if he will not yield to texts of scripture, is to jeer and flout him, for he cannot bear scorn. And then he's got a quote from Thomas More, the devil, the proud spirit cannot endure to be mocked. Now that's related to the devil, and we're talking about interacting with human beings. But at the same time, people can hold some devilish doctrines, doctrines of demons, as Paul puts it. And in some cases, mockery and derision can be apt. So it's a tool. It's a tool in the apologist's toolbox. I don't think it's the main tool, but sometimes you need that very specialized tool to do a specialized work. And I think in some cases, a spirit-led mockery can do that kind of work. But we have to be really careful not to mock as the way fools mock, because scripture condemns that. Well, if we want to employ this tool, I guess, delicately, because it requires discernment, is there a way that Christians can combine mockery with love? Well, I think so, because biblically, Uh, The greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus said even to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So ultimately, everything we do should be done in love, in the power of the Holy Spirit, because we know God is love, and uh, love is the greatest of all the virtues as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. So it can be loving to inflict needed pain, right? So you can think of going to a physician and you need to have an injection. It's going to hurt a little bit. Going to the dentist, uh, it's going to hurt a little bit. So this is not sadism. We should not enjoy showing the fallacies of another person's worldview or showing that they're beliefs and ways of living are foolish, we should gain no pleasure in this whatsoever. But in some cases, someone, you might say you have to hold their feet to the philosophical fire. You have to, as Schaefer said, take the roof off their worldview and show that what they believe will not hold up and that the acids of reality come raining down on their false beliefs. I think it's possible. I think it's difficult. So this is kind of a funny article in a way, because typically when I write articles, I'll say, here's a good argument for God, a good argument for the Bible, for Jesus. Everybody can go out and do this. Let's be brave. Let's be creative. This article is more like, here's a tool 
that can sometimes be used for certain people in certain circumstances, but it's not easy. And in most cases, you probably shouldn't do it. But there are cases where it is appropriate because we find it in scripture and we find it in some great apologists like Irenaeus and a few others. So, you know, what's a good example that you could give us of mockery? You've given us some in the Bible and you gave one about Irenaeus, but are there other examples where people have employed this well, or maybe some personal examples that you have from your experience of so many years doing Christian apologetics? Well, I can give an example uh, that relates to ethics. I was in campus ministry back in the 80s at the University of Washington, and there was a controversy on campus about uh, whether monkeys should be used in research, scientific research. And I wrote a letter to the editor and I said, this is horrible. Monkeys should never be used in research. This is cruel and unnecessary. And if we start using monkeys for scientific research, we might eventually start aborting unborn children. And that would be horrible. So obviously that's a kind of mockery and it's a trick. So I'm using, they did publish the article, the little letter to the editor there. So you get people going in one direction, like, yes, it is wrong to experiment on monkeys. And then you take it in a direction that people didn't expect. Really, how much worse is aborting innocent unborn children than experimenting on monkeys? So I did that in a letter to the editor. I don't know that I have a lot of great examples of, of using mockery or showing the absurd as absurd, but it's a tool that we can use. And I think some folks are very gifted at it. If you have a really good sense of humor and kind of a prankish attitude, but you you love God and you love unbelievers and want them to come to Christ, I think that this can be employed. Now, you did give us just a lot of cautions. And, you know, I, I definitely want to find out, well, what are some of the dangers of using this? I mean, there's cautions that you said, well, we have to have a lot of discernment. And you said certain people could use it. I mean, how does the Christian know if they're that person that could use it effectively and not be seen as belittling others or coming across as cruel or mean, especially a lot of people interact with folks online? Right. And it's very easy to be snide and cutting online, especially when there's really very little accountability. So you could make a nasty remark on Facebook or Twitter and someone responds and then you just decide to delete the remark or block them. So you have no real personal accountability. We have to really guard our hearts and be careful. I think often of what Jesus said, by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you'll be condemned. And that includes Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the rest of it. I think uh, walking with the Lord over a long period of time, stay in the scripture, read it, meditate on it, memorize it, have Christian friends who can hold you accountable, who can point out your weaknesses and challenge you in various areas, and then read the great apologists. Uh, I could have explored this a lot more, but one of my favorite apologists is G.K. Chesterton, and he just had an extremely sharp sense of humor. He used paradox, and he went after the unbelievers, the atheists of the day, the pantheists, the theosophists, and all the rest of it. But he did so in such a cheerful kind of way, genial kind of way, that he was friends with a lot of these folks. You know, they would have a debate and then they go out for a drink afterwards. So I think uh, the spirit of Chesterton would be quite appropriate to emulate. Well, this has certainly given a lot of thought to the Christian apologist to think through, okay, what is a creative way to engage in apologetics, but also do it, you know, with um, gentleness and respect and be able to engage people to show them how ludicrous their ideas are. And I think sometimes, even if we're not using 
mockery, people are just offended by the gospel and you show them inconsistencies in their thinking and that sometimes that can't be helped in terms of their response. So we need to keep that in mind too. Yeah. Maybe I can just add one other thing. Uh, A lot of people know the Babylon Bee, which is a satire website and it's become very popular recently and they've published a few books. Sometimes they will touch on apologetic issues. They're usually discussing politics and culture, but satire is a form of mockery as well. And I didn't go into that in a lot of detail in my article, but I think the Babylon Bee can often point out the absurdity of viewpoints by their use of satire. And they're very clever, usually, and witty about that kind of thing. I agree. I think that satire can be done well and in an intelligent and mannered, measured way to get people to think a little bit more deeply about some of the worldviews that they hold. Well, finally, on a much lighter note than mockery in apologetics, Doug, it is been the school year has started. We're in full swing, of course, at almost the end of the semester coming up because it's November. But I want to know what's one of your favorite things about the time that you've been teaching at Denver Seminary all these years? Yes. Well, I just started my uh, 31st year at Denver Seminary. I love the classroom. I love it when students learn, when they ask good questions, when they challenge me and I come up with new ideas, or I realize I have to develop one of my arguments better. I just love the classroom. It's really my favorite place to be because that's where knowledge happens. And given what I teach, philosophy, apologetics, and ethics, the kind of knowledge that I am trying to spark and sustain is very significant. So, The classroom, when it works well, when people are engaged, is just a joyful place for me to be. And I hope, God willing, I can continue to do that uh, for many more years. Well, thanks, Doug, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Episode 366 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Dr. Doug Roteis. He has written an online exclusive article for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called The Use of Mockery in Apologetics. And you can read it for free at our website, equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Canegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that, and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Mm-hmm.